you. It's so good to be here. I was so pleased to get this invitation from um, Mirav, and uh, I hope she'll be with us soon. This is a wonderful project that we have many, many shared interests. So I am um, a professor of ethnomusicology and musicology at UCLA in the Herb Alpert School of Music. I hold the Mickey Katz Endowed Chair in Jewish Music. And I also direct the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience. I did my doctoral work at New York University and I uh, um, worked on the music of the Syrian uh, community, the Syrian Jews in Brooklyn, which I will present uh, to you today. So my understanding is that uh, I should speak for about 40 minutes or so, and then I'm happy to take any comments or questions uh, that anyone has. So um, I wanna recognize the important theme of this particular uh, program, which is focused on, hold on, I think there's a, hang on, let me just start this share again. I just wanna move over this box so that um, it doesn't conflict. Hopefully you can see my screen as fully as possible. Um, so the shared traditions between Judaism and Islam, which we uh, know through the golden age of Spain with its connection to Christianity through many levels of, of uh, religious influence through theology, in um, the case of Judaism and Islam through halakha or the way that law is formed, linguistic connections between languages, um, it's no um, surprise that music and other ritual practices are very similar. So what I'm gonna share with you is how Arab and Islamic traditions are highly influenced within the Brooklyn Jewish community. I'm primarily talking about my research of the Brooklyn Jews who, uh, excuse me, the Syrian Jews from Aleppo who are in Brooklyn, but I'll make some parallels to other communities um, as well. So to give you a very brief historical background, the two cities that Syrian Jews are primarily from are from the two big cities in Syria, which is Aleppo and Damascus. Aleppo being in the north, uh, borders on the southern, um, uh, on southern Turkey. So Kilis and Anteb, which also had various Jewish communities, um, have very similar practices to the Aleppo Jews. And the Damascus Jews and all Syrian Jews have very, very similar practices to the Lebanon Jews. And of course, being that these were just one region or only politically divided in more recent history, it makes good sense that there's shared traditions between this area of the Levant or the Fertile Crescent. Both Aleppo and Damascus are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, and the name for Aleppo in Hebrew is actually an Arabic name, which is Aram Soba. And in the second book of Samuel, um, Aram Soba is mentioned in two verses, and also the book of Psalms, Aram Soba is also mentioned. Damascus is known as Aram Damasek, and uh, that is mentioned in the book of Chronicles and the second book of Samuel, as well as the second book of Kings. So both of these cities were our old cities, as we well know, and that the Jewish community has been there as certainly as um, early as biblical times. And the story is that King David sent his general, Yoav, who became Noah, known as Yoav ben Surya, to conquer the north. And there are many interesting discussions in the rabbinic era during the um, second and third century where during the sabbatical law years of the land known as Shemitah, the question is, can you harvest the land in, in, in like Aleppo or Damascus because it's uh, bordering on the northern border of Israel? So there's this sense that, that these lands of, uh, that, that the Syrian Jews are living in has that close connection uh, to Israel. Um, 
going on into uh, the history of the Syrian community and its various um, diasporas, um, really beginning with uh, in the late 19th century with the building of the Suez Canal, Jews start leaving Syria. And you can see that um, uh, there are communities in different parts of the world. There were communities uh, uh, in China, um, in Manchester, uh, England, and um, other parts of the world too. I, although not mentioned on this map, there was a small group of Syrian Jews that went to India. But in North America and South America and Central America, um, there are Syrian uh, communities, and those are still very, very active communities. Uh, what I'd like to do is play a video of a wonderful um, a documentary that was done in Israel in the 1970s, where they went into a synagogue in a, a community within Jerusalem called Machane Yehuda, and they videotaped um, a singing of a particular practice called Bakashot. Um, we tested this video earlier. It might be very, very low, so you might need to turn up the volume on this one. If you have any difficulties with this, just let me know. So I hope what you can hear in this particular video is this exuberant singing. And you have different type of sections where you have someone singing solo, usually um, you know, an older man. And then everyone else, in this case, it, men and women are separated. So you just see the men and boys um, who are singing very exuberantly together. This practice of Bakashot was a practice where between the holiday of um, Sukkot, which would be, you know, the beginning of, of winter, of, of fall time, through winter until Passover, till the beginning of spring, so for that roughly six-month period, uh, which is going through fall and winter, um, people would come uh, in the middle of the night on early Saturday morning, and they would uh, sing a series of prayers for a few hours, not, not actually not prayers, you can sing a series of what are called piyotim, which is um, various types of biblical, uh, excuse me, of, of a different type of, of Hebrew poetry uh, that they would sing, largely very Arabic um, musically uh, influenced. Um, this particular presentation was done on, on a Thursday night so they could recreate the experience. So I just want to give you a sense of, of, of what this music and cultural sounds like. So one of the things to really talk about just in terms of the history is the multiple influences that came into the Syrian community. So in addition to there being uh, a community since biblical times, Syrian Jews uh, also received people um, at various points in time. And one of the most significant ones is that it, during the period of time of the expulsions from Spain in 1492, the furthest east that the Spanish Jews traveled was uh, into, into Syria. 
So they operated uh, along as a separate community for a few hundred years. Uh, there are some really interesting statements that, that have been made. This is by um, an, uh, a scholar by the name of um, Abraham Marcus. He's a professor at the University of Texas. Um, he grew up, um, uh, was born in Syria and then uh, moved, his family moved to Israel. And uh, he talks about, he wrote a book called Aleppo on the Eve of Modernity. And here's a comment that he makes. In this eclectic milieu, the oral, the illiterate, the popular and the non-religious occupied an important place and ought not to be dismissed or belittled in favor of the written, the literate, the high and the religious. The various elements actually fed on each other and tend to illuminate the cultural best when seen as parts of a whole rather than as self-contained spheres. So this aspect of this um, intermingling between literate and non-literate, um, um, oral and written, are all very important parts of understanding this culture because the recitation of oral poetry, of, of oral texts, is a very important art form within the community. In more recent years, um, this is a statement by a well-known Israeli author named Amon, Amnon Shemosh. And in his book uh, called My Sister the Bride, he has a chapter called A Child of Two Cities, where he talks about his upbringing in Aleppo. And he says some very curious things here. Halab, and Halab is um, an, an, another Hebrew name, he says other, for Aleppo, otherwise known as Aleppo or Ramsoba, was a meeting point of three cultures. This is expressed not only in the three names by which we call their city, but also and especially in the languages we spoke. It was Arabic at home, French in society and on the street, and Hebrew in synagogue. Of the fourth element, this uh, Sephardi one, I was not aware until my arrival in Eretz Israel, that is where I was immediately downgraded to the status of Sephardi. Ladino, the Spanish Jewish dialect, had been cast aside, nobody spoke it. Several generations before, it is true, waves of Ladino speaking Jews had migrated to our city from all the Mediterranean countries, especially the North, but the immigration had been completely absorbed into the Eastern society. And in my generation, there was no distinguishing them. So the Western Sephardic traditions, which came in around the end of the 15th century in 1492, by the time you get 200 years later, they're absorbed into the community. If you'd like to know more about that particular part of the history, I could tell you. But I think it's very interesting to really show that in the 20th century, before Jews really started their mass migration from Aleppo, they were really living in a multilingual environment. And of course, the French influences because of the Alliance Israel um, that um, came into the region and uh, set up educational schools. Uh, this is just a chart that I put together of looking at the general Mediterranean region of Jews and really showing before Israel became a state in 1948, there are roughly a million Jews living in the Mediterranean area. I and mean, you can see that more and more uh, Jews have migrated. And uh, the big Syrian migration, like many other communities, was pretty much uh, very soon after uh, Israel becomes a state. Um, and then um, tensions really increased very significantly uh, for Jews who needed to leave. And in the, um, in the really throughout most of the 1990s, most of the Syrian Jews who were left, you can see there were 4,000. 4,750 in 1985, and in the 1990s, as the previous president, Afas Assad, wanted to make gestures to the West, mostly to America, uh, they were letting the Syrian Jews leave at that time. You can still see their sizable Jewish communities still in Iran and Turkey uh, and so forth. So that brings us to the uh, one of the biggest communities, of Syrian Jews, and that is in Brooklyn. And Jews came into Brooklyn in the late 1800s, around the same time that Eastern European Jews came. And they first settled in the Lower East Side in Williamsburg. Um, they had a very short time where they went, um, uh, went to Williamsburg, just over the bridge in uh, Brooklyn. 
but they mostly settled by uh, the uh, early 1900s into Flatbush. First into Bensonhurst, uh, they came and then, then they came into Flatbush. And Flatbush now has, it's estimated to be between 65 and 70,000 Syrian Jews. And that's considered to be the largest um, Syrian community, uh, largest Jewish Syrian community in the world. The other communities are smaller. There are um, uh, just a little bit over 40 different Syrian Jewish institutions and organizations. Um, 20 of them are synagogues. There are um, older senior living facilities. There's a Bikr Cholim. Um, there, there are many other organizations that they have. So I worked with the Syrian community in Brooklyn. This is a photograph of their oldest remaining synagogue uh, in Bensonhurst. It's now um, still used by them, but it's in a, the neighborhood has become more Hasidic. So more Hasidim are using this building during the year. This synagogue, which is um, called Sha'arei Tzion, is really the flagship uh, synagogue for the community. It's where the chief rabbi sits, is at this synagogue. It's the largest Syrian synagogue. And having the American flag in front of the synagogue is a very important thing for the community. There are many World War II veterans, and they're very proud to, be, to have served in the American military and uh, very proud to be Americans. But they live as an autonomous community. Um, uh, there are many fascinating experiences I had when I was doing my field work in the early 90s of going to these various Syrian synagogues. And I myself am not Syrian, so it's I'm 100% Ashkenazic. So going into these communities was a brand new experience. And um, to, to be in the community for a Shabbat and to have politicians really come into the community to try and uh, get their votes during the political season uh, is a really good indication of how seriously people really take the community. And it is also a very affluent community. This is the second largest synagogue, which is called Congregation Bet Torah. And they're in just different ends of the community. And this is the synagogue that I did my field work with, or field work at. This was built in 1970s. And as you would walk into the synagogue, you would view it this way where off into the distance, you would um, uh, have the Aron, which is in the lower center middle. And um, on the right side and left side is where the men would sit. And sort of to our forefront is what they call the Teba or the prayer platform. And above it in this canonical 1970s artistry is supposed to be the end of the shofar. And their artistic interpretation is that the one who's leading the prayers, the Hazan, is singing his prayers and they're going up into the shofar and then off into the heavens. So that's their, their 1970s architecture of the synagogue. I just want to give you just a small taste of some of the singing in the community. This is the Syrian community in Brooklyn, and this is a 1990s recording. Um, this is a song called Ani Ashirlach. I'll tell you more about the influences of the music. But if you read music, you can see the notes notated on the left. If you read Hebrew, it's at the top. And then the English translation is below. We'll hear more music in a moment, but I just wanted to give you a feel for it. And the singer, we'll hear more about him. His name is Moses Tawil, and I'll tell you more about him in just a minute. So the two progenitors of the tradition is Rabbi Raphael Antebi Tabush, and he's considered to be the founder and developer of the modern practices that they do to incorporate music into their prayer. 
And his student, although only just a few years younger, is Rabbi Moses um, Asher in um, uh, Hebrew or in Arabic. His name was Ashkar, but they said he changed his name to Asher when he came to America. He came to America in the 19 teens and served for 25 years until he died in 1940. And uh, he really brought um, Raphael and Tebi Tabush's traditions uh, to Brooklyn. And the cantors that I studied with were ultimately students of Rabbi Moses Asher. Um, his, uh, most of the people who studied with him directly had passed away by the time I was starting to study um, about the community in 1990. So I studied with the um, students of the students of Rabbi Moses Asher. So the uh, three main cantors in the community that I worked with in the 1990s, who were the real leaders of cantorial traditions in the community from the 1950s through 2000, now uh, sadly two of them have passed away, um, are these three men, Moses and David Tawil, and they're both brothers. Um, they're younger brothers where their older brothers studied with Asher, and then Isaac Cabasso. So I did a project um, about 20, nearly, well, maybe almost 25 years ago. And this is the um, a interview I did with Moses Tawil. I just want to play a couple of minutes so you can hear Moses Tawil really talk about himself and talk about the community. Your name and when you were My name is Moses Tawil, Tawil, in the Arabic connotation. And you were, and tell us when you were born? I was born on April 7th, 1915, 1915. here in New York. Okay. And um, why don't you tell us the capacity in which um, you've served in the community, when and where you've served uh, as a cantor and your activities now? Well, uh, I have to tell you first, it's not only I. Every one of my brothers has more or less served in more or less the same capacity that I described. We are, we're all involved and have been involved in Bateka Nisiyot and Yeshivot. I was vice president of the Magen David Yeshiva. I was chairman of the educational department. I was vice president of Shahar Siyon. My brother Ishaq Isaac Alav Shalom. He was the president of the Shahar Siyon. <coughs> Excuse me. I was president of the congregation in Bradley Beach, the summer resort where we used to attend. To. And uh, I've always been involved in many different facets of the community work. This is. I would say it's a way of life for the whole, this the wheel family. So your father did the same thing your father? Absolutely. My father was the first president of the wonderful edifice that was built in 1923 on 67th Street, the original Magen David Synagogue congregation. In, in he was its first president and one of its pillars, one of the main founders of that synagogue. When did your father came from? About 1913, 1912, this is our guest so right estimate. Yes, I was born in 1915, yes. 1915. And uh, was he a cantor too, among other? Yes, I have to describe to you what you're, uh, you're all referring to us as cantors. Yeah. We consider ourselves cantors of fantasia, of luxury. But I mean, uh, none of us does it for a living. Mm -hmm. None of us does it professionally. By professional, I mean we don't get paid for our cantorial talents. We are volunteers, and uh, we just happen to be from a family who is really uh, imbued with this feeling, cantorial feeling, and uh, also the Arabic singing. As a youth, I sang only Arabic. So he really provides this context for us about the environment in which he lived in, where the Arabic music and the cantorial were all deeply interconnected. So I want to give you a more insider look into this music and how these things come together. And the best way to describe it is as a process of adaptation. And this process of adaptation is where a song first begins as an Arabic song with an Arabic text and Arabic music. And they keep the Arabic music and they just change the words. And the words that they change they, it becomes a Hebrew text. And this is what's known as a pismon or a piyut. Piyut would be the larger category of this genre, where for the Syrian community, they call them 
they call it a pismon. And in modern Hebrew, pismon means a chorus. So usually sometimes these songs have a, like a repeating chorus. Then this music goes into the liturgy. So to give you a more intimate take of it, this is a song that was recorded in the 1920s in Arabic by Zaki Murad. And what you see on line one, line two, three, and four in the white is a transliteration of the Arabic. So I'm going to first play for you um, the Arabic, um, and you just follow along the white lines, and then I'll play for you what the piyut sounds like. <laughs> Now I'll play for you uh, the Arabic, excuse me, we just played for you the Arabic, now the Hebrew, which is going to be sung by Isaac Cabasso. And he, we went into a recording studio uh, about 20 years ago when he was building this. Boy, Berenna, Ya Ali Adina, Lebeti Ata, Beum Cheshkona, Lebeti Ata, Beum Cheshkona, Oi Bechbara, Yishaik Bara. Orech zarach et lechenena. So some of the things that you'll notice is that the piyut, the lines that are in green, are following the rhyme scheme of the Arabic. So in the first line, there's a na rhyme, boy berina, ya ala adina, which is follow, following hawad min hina ta ala indina in Arabic. The second line in Arabic, Ya Allah Ana Wintan Habibi Badina, in Hebrew, Labeti Ata, so it's following the Ta rhyme, and then the MF Eshkona follows the other line. So the Arabic song becomes a model for which that they write the Hebrew song. So they're not only taking the words, they're taking some aspects, at least the rhyme scheme of the originating Arabic song. You'll also notice that there's one instance in the end of the first line where ta'ala indina, the, the part that I've underlined, becomes ya'ala adina. Those two things sound so similar. So we call that, of course, alliteration. So the alliteration between the Arabic is then followed into the Hebrew. So it shows you that there's a very close relationship. So the question comes up is, why is there such a close relationship? And the reason is, is that the Jews at this time were living in their own communities, which is called a Mela, in this case, in Aleppo. And when they were living in their own Mela's uh, during this time period, and again, this would have been the 1920s, they would uh, live in their own communities, but they would work in the more common community and they would meet the, their Arab neighbors. And they would often go to these coffee shops, Turkish coffee shops, and they would hear the latest Arabic songs. They're mostly love songs. And the rabbis didn't want them singing these Arabic love songs, but the cantors wanted to sing these melodies, so they created Hebrew words to sound like these Arab melodies. So before I get into the liturgical application, let me just tell you a little bit about the meaning of these songs. So the Arabic love song, Stop Over, Come to Us, Come On, Let Us Love One Another, is changed to come in song, gentle, graceful woman to my house now and I will dwell with you. And this is not about carnal love, but this boy berina is very similar to the way that Shira Shirim or the Song of Songs is done, which is about the union between God and the people of Israel. And this is something that's also done on Shabbat, where there are various songs, Lechad uh, there's a phrase called uh, Boy V'Shalom, which has some similar phrases in this. So there are different Jewish practices uh, of these, um, of 
of love, but it's not about carnal love. It's really about uh, love of God and love of Israel to God. So the liturgical setting that they set it to is a phrase um, that's in their Saturday morning liturgy. It happens to not uh, be a phrase that's in Ashkenazic liturgy, and it comes in the morning service. Um, and uh, Shabbat Anim, which I have listed for you here, is in transliterated in the white lines, and the green lines is the um, is the translation. And uh, again, you'll hear it's the same melody. So again, this process of adaptation is taking an original Arabic song, it then becomes a piyut, and then it finally gets into the liturgy. And this will be what the liturgy sounds like. Shavat anim atat shema' Sakat haddal takshim v'toshiyah Ikhatu branenu sadikim badunai lai sharim So this is just one example how Arabic culture is developed into the community, and it's not only the melody, but it's the essence of the music, it's the spirit of the music. Sometimes the meaning and the sound of the words. So to go more deeply into this Arab and Islamic connection, what I want to do is show you more parallels. So there are three categories of influence. One would be the recitation of the Quran. The other would be different forms of vocal improvisation. And then finally, different type of song forms. There are two styles of, of Quranic recitation, a more simplified form of recitation that's called Muratal, and the other more complex is called Mujwad. So I want to play both of those for you so we can have the sound of, of, um, of Quranic recitation, and then I can share with you various parallels. <laughs> والضحى والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى ولا الآخرة خير لك من الأولى ولسوف يؤمن so you can hear in this style, as we say in music, it's mostly syllabic, where one note has one word. The Mujawad style, you have many more embellishments. <laughs> long pauses and as they get to the next passage, the next surah. So you have this uh, um, appreciation now for how the muratal is a more simplified mujawad is more embellished. There are different types of vocal improvisations, one that's called a mawal, which is for um, Arabic vocal, uh, Arabic, excuse me, instrumental music. And layeli is what the type of vocal improvisation that they would do in different type of song genres. So I'll play for you other examples where we'll see that there are these different developments. What's really crucial to understanding in the underpinnings of the music is what is called the maqam system. So Arabic music sounds different to the Western ear because it makes use of various maqamat. So this is a, um, a chart of the eight basic maqamat that are used in the community that uh, was presented to me by David Tawil, um, Moses Tawil's younger brother. And the first one, which starts in a B flat, is like a major scale in, um, uh, in Western music. And the third one, Nahawand, is like a minor scale. So they incorporate major and minor scales. So Western music 
fits well within their system. But then they make use of another note, as we see in Makam Ras, the Makam Bayat, and Saba, is something known as an E quarter flat. So to give you kind of an appreciation of what the E quarter flat is, is that it's a note that's, and I'll be just a little bit technical, but it's not too confusing, where if you divide the distance on music between D and F, it makes up three quarters. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, called, what do you say, a step and a half. Um, and through a step and a half, it divides into two equal three quarters. So the note E quarter flat is just the mathematical middle between the notes D and F. And that E quarter flat is not as flat uh, as an E flat and exists between the notes E flat and E. So if you were to look at a piano and you have an E and an E flat, right? The black key and the white key of the, of, uh, of um, you know, an E and an E flat. The E quarter flat is right in the middle there. So you couldn't play this on a piano. You couldn't play this on a fixed pitched instrument like a clarinet, but you could on a violin or other instruments that don't have fixed pitches. In contemporary Arabic music, they're able electronically to change the tunings by you know, hitting a button on the keyboard, but at least within acoustic instruments, it needs to be an instrument that's really built for this. So to give you a sense of how this works, I hope this isn't being too confusing to you, but I thought that this might help. What I've represented for you is the fretboard of the oud. And if we always in music schools, you know, we use piano in the C major scale to really describe all of Western music because C is the easiest scale and you look at it in the piano. The equivalent to that is looking at an oud, uh, is using an oud and using a kamras. So I'll explain it to you as follows. If you look on the very, um, what would look to us to be on our bottom string, those are the highest notes. The top of our screen, those strings would be the lowest notes. So the oud has two strings. So the open string is a C at the very top and then a G, and then you have um, a D. So if you were to play Makam Rost, you would play the open string, the very last open string, which is the C. Then you would put your index finger where there's a D, and then you would put your next finger on the E flat and your next finger on the F. Then you could put another finger on the G or you play the next open string. But if you look, you can see that between D and F, the E quarter flat is exactly half of that distance. If you went a little more to the left, it would be an E flat. If you went a little more to the right, it would be an E natural. So I hope that gives you some kind of tactile or visual way to really see what this is. So Makam Ross becomes this very important and uh, primordial scale. Oops. This, um, all right, so this, I don't want to get into this, these technical uh, details. So this various listing of these makamat helped to organize the liturgy in the community. And that's what I want to point you towards. So if you look within the, uh, there's a book that's called Shir Ushvacha Halal Vizimra. So I don't have a picture of it here, but it's a, it's a book of their poetry. And they don't write out their music. They, everything they learn is by ear musically. So they're transmitting the music through different texts that people know um, orally. And they organize the different poetic texts by Makam. And this lists out for you all the different, uh, the, the number of pismonim that they have, which is 557. And then you see them in, in different makamat as you go down the list here. What's interesting to note is makam bayat is the most popular makam. And interestingly, makam is bayat, bayat is the makam that's used to recite the Quran. So because Quranic recitation is just the sonic environment of, of Islam and of Arab culture, 
It really comes into popular songs and has come into the Syrian community's music. Um, what um, I want to show you is that in the Syrian Sabbath morning service, they organize the different sections of the service by different makamat. So the basic prayer in the Syrian community is not a makam bayat, it's in another makam called makam siga. And, but the Syrian Jews have a unique feature. It's not just unique to them. It's something that also happens in Turkish and Moroccan music. But in the Syrian tradition that I'm talking about now, the hazan, the person who's the most musically skilled, leads the third part of the prayer service called the shacharit prayers in the Sabbath morning service. And they do that in a different makam every week. And this is how the system works, is that the entire Hebrew Bible is divided up week by week to different prayers. So the book of Genesis has 12 sections, Exodus has um, uh, 10. And um, the different makmat are associated with different biblical readings. So because rast is considered to be the beginning in Arabic music, they use that to begin Parsha Breshit, because Breshit, the book opening of the book of Genesis, is the beginnings of the worlds, the beginning of life, beginning of Judaism. So they use it for Makam Ras. Makam Saba, they use when circumcision is mentioned. And in Lech Lecha, which is actually the, the Parsha of this week in the Jewish calendar, um, Abraham is circumcised. So they use Makam Saba. Hijaz is used for sad things. In this case of Chayasara 1.5 is when the matriarch Sarah passes away. And in Exodus, Beshalach is when um, the Jews leave Egypt and cross the sea. And uh, that's considered to be happy. So they use Makam Ajam uh, for that. And this just uh, shows you what the whole table looks like, Parsha by Parsha. And, here they have the, um, the various portions uh, of the Bible, different parts of the calendar year, of the holidays of Sukkot and Passover, and they tell you on each day what makam is used, and it's just the makam for that part of the service. What's interesting is that there is sort of this system that develops that I write about in my books and my articles that Rost is associated because of the sense of the theory of Arabic music begins in Makam Rost, so they begin that way. And the others I call affect. So circumcision or sadness or happiness are all by, uh, uh, are, are for that purpose. And then in other cases, there might be a well-known melody that they want to use. And so there's a melody association. So the end result is that week by week, there's a different Makam. What's interesting to note about this is that if we look within Arab music, they use Rost and Ajam for glory and dignity. Hijaz is used for things that are simple and pretty. Saba is used for delicate, tender, and things for sadness. So in the world of sort of like the Afet and Makamat, the Syrian Jews are not fully following the Arabic system. They're following the practice of different affects associate a feeling or a circumstance to a particular makam, but in this particular case, the Syrian Jews are doing something different than is found in normative Arabic practice. So um, I know that I should be ending shortly, but I want to kind of give you just a sonic representation of different things in the community. So what I'd like to do is just begin by sharing with you how in the different parts of the service, such as what's called Birchot Shachar, opening blessings, there's a particular sound. As me wrote, where they recite various psalm texts, there's a different type of sound. And I'll show you how, how that works in these different examples. So here, this is a very quick recitation pattern in these opening blessings. <laughs> So within this 
Syrian tradition, as is in most um, Sephardic traditions, they recite all the prayers out loud. The Ashkenazic tradition happens to just say the ends of, of, of uh, paragraphs uh, out loud. Here they recite everything, so it's a very, very quick speed. As they get into the uh, psalm, uh, their expression of psalms, it gets a little more melodic. And then other parts, such as the beginning of a new section, um, they use well-known melodies, and this is a melody that they have adapted from Hatikva, the Israel National Anthem. I just have a few more examples to play for you, but again, the point being that the, the maqam and style of each of these sections are unique, and it's this middle section, Shafarif, that the most important things happen. And to provide the parallel to Quranic recitation is that the very simplified forms, such as Birchat um, Hashachar in Zmirot, the Torah reading itself, is all done with the Memura Ta style, or the Mujawad, the more embellished style, is how they do that middle part um, that's called Shafari. So um, they have various associations within Shacharit, where they sing seven different parts of that part of the service. And sometimes they use what they call heavy melodies, which are often done to more formalized Arabic music in things that's, that are uh, called a tartuka, which is just like a simple melody, is what they call light. So they ju juxtapose sort of um, heavy, more elaborate music and more quick paced music throughout this section. Um, I don't want to get into too many technicalities. I don't have transliteration here, but this is the opening part of where the cantor begins. This is cantor or Hazan David Shiro. He came into the, grew up in Israel, raised within the uh, Middle Eastern community in Israel. And uh, when he came to Brooklyn about 25 years ago, he was sort of retrained as to how to be a Brooklyn Syrian cantor. And in this video, he's flanked by Mo Tawil to his right and David Tawil to his left. And you'll hear how he does the opening part um, of the service. <laughs> These first five lines are like an introduction. And when he gets to Mishmat Kokai, which is the indented part, this is based on an Arabic song. Nishmat Kalchai, which is the Arabic poem. This is a heavy moment.
So just to give you one other example, we're going to play another part of the service where they bring in a light melody. This is where the text Shabbat Anin comes in. And this is a congregational melody. So again, to make uh, this point again, each part of the service sounds a little different, pulling off different type of styles. And to sort of bring this all together for you, I'd like you to just look at this particular conceptual chart, where you can see in the middle is the liturgy of the Syrian tradition, which has the music and the text. And if you look at the right side, the liturgy is really made up of biblical texts, of rabbinic texts, and these are the Jewish elements. If you look at the right side, the Arabic and Islamic elements is Arabic songs, which there's Arabic poetry and music that makes up the Arabic songs. They then influence the pismonim. And based on the makam, those melodies then come into the liturgy. And remember that that makam of the day, those seven things that they sung, every week it's going to be different one from the next. Rast one week, bayat the next, then ajam. So every week there's a different series of melodies, which is a highly unique system because it because it's not just different melodies, it's melodies in a different makam. Quranic recitation has this stylistic influence and also the extra musical associations of how a makam is associated with a biblical reading, which of course comes from an Arabic practice, um, also influences the liturgy. So as a denouement or as a way to conclude, the way I perceive of the Syrian Jewish tradition, it's that it's this interesting negotiation between the Jewish religious tradition, Jewish ritual life, Jewish texts, Jewish history, Jewish practices, and Arabic and Islamic culture, and the way that the Syrian Jews pray is very much in it very much um, aesthetically Arabic. It's very aesthetically influenced by Arab, Arabic, and Islamic traditions. So it's this again, this interesting middle, a very interesting negotiation. So I spoke a little longer than I wanted, but I have plenty of time to um, uh, to answer really any questions. And I just thank you all for listening. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I think it's such a unique and interesting community and to present it in this environment, in this form was a really special experience and just welcome any of your comments. So thank you very much.